question here, Wayne. Is it popping up my screen or, or Wayne? <laughs> I got Wayne on the mind here, Lee. Is it popping up my screen okay now? I just want to check if everybody can see this. Yes, I see it. Okay, perfect. Okay, well, before we get started, I, I want to say thank you to Lee for having me present. Uh, just having been in the publishing industry for many years, I've seen a lot of characters, and Lee operates with integrity that's above reproach, and he goes way, way beyond what's normal for publishers in his devotion to helping writers promote their work. So. Um, thank you so much, Lee. I really appreciate it. Um, to add a little bit more of my background, I've taught creative writing since about 1988, and I've earned income from my writing and editing for 35 years. I know writing, editing, and publishing inside out because I co-owned a publishing company and I was executive editor for another publishing house. Recently, I began accepting work for a new publishing house, Circle of Light Publishing. But because I accept very few works, and I'm talking maybe, maybe four this year, I teach writers through in-person classes and webinars how they can position themselves for greater success with their writing. I speak internationally, addressing topics such as forgiveness, intuition, and of course, writing. I'd say the one element that sets me apart from other editors is that I have a strong marketing background. When editing, I know how to set books up so they'll have the greatest chance of selling well. Uh, an example of that is in my latest book, um, called Kindle Income Three Ways. I show writers how they can make more income inside their books, whether they're writing fiction or nonfiction. Part of that strategy is with sponsorships, and I outline exactly how that works in that book. I've done marketing on an international scale, and I've worked with clients such as Nike, Nationwide Insurance, and a host of other large corporations. So the the topic is um, about perfection, but I want to say that perfection is an ongoing process. Ebooks can be a good working draft sometimes before print, but you definitely don't want to be sloppy. And uh, this slide, I, I'm pretty sure, Lee, you can, you can tell me, I think this is a picture of one of uh, Wayne's tattoos, Wayne Standiford's tattoos. <laughs> uh, and I, 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 have, I have allies in getting back at the old Marine. <laughs> <laughs> so so when, you're, um, when you're looking at your work, you, you do want to make sure that if you put something into print that uh, it, it's error free. So on, on this forum, unfortunately, I've seen many books, and I guess maybe about 90% actually, which is pretty high, that I, I can't endorse because they're poorly written and poorly edited. Um, but fortunately, that's something that can be fixed. And my goal today is to give you some tools in your editing arsenal that will help you do basic editing on your own and provide you with the opportunity to get better reviews and more reviews, which of course translates into more sales. So here's some of the things that we're going to cover. And we'll cover why you want to learn how to do basic editing for yourself, the most common punctuation and grammar mistakes, what you should look for in an editor, plus what an editor does and does not do the basics of what an editor charges, and the top five ways to edit your work, and perhaps more importantly, or most importantly, how to know if your book is ready to launch. Now, I want to start by saying there's some misconceptions about who makes a good book editor. It's not someone with an English degree 
or other writers. Book editors tend to have experience in specific genres and they have preferences. For example, I enjoy editing all genres except romance. And I'll even edit a romance if there's some other elements in it, like maybe it's a paranormal romance, for example. Um, book editors also take time with the book, go, going over each book multiple times. And generally, that's not something a friend will do for you. Traditional publishing does one thing right. They make sure that a book is well edited before it's produced. They also know editing for fiction and nonfiction are different, and that's something that a book editor will, will take into account. But before you pay for an editor, it's super important to do all the work you can do on your own so you can get the lowest rate when you do hire an editor. And because it's important to know this, you, you want to have um, the basic editing done because a good editor isn't inexpensive. And we'll go into some of the rates later. But he or she can help you make the difference between having your book create income and be a flop. So an editor can also make you look really professional, and, and that's, that's our goal. If you're writing nonfiction, editing errors that make you appear sloppy create the impression that if you're sloppy about your writing, you are likely sloppy about your facts, so the reader discredits your work. <clears throat> Pardon me. A reader who picks up your work of fiction wants to be caught up in the story not constantly seeing grammar errors or finding that your point of view is off or there's some other issue that arises that takes them out of the story. Because once they're taken out of that story and they're looking at all of those things instead of being engaged in your story, they're going to put the book down. Also, if you want a reader to purchase not just one of your books, but all the books that you write, you need to make sure that your copy is as clean as possible. And if it's not, they won't give you a shot in the future. So I'm going to start with some basics. Um, and as you can see, punctuation. Um, probably a lot of you have seen this uh, poster floating around the internet. Um, there's a difference between let's eat grandma and let's eat grandma. So you want to pay attention to commas. If you um, use commas for direction, for example, um, this sign, hunters use caution when hunting pedestrians using the walking trails. If you use your commas appropriately, which I can understand, you wouldn't necessarily on a, a, a sign, but uh, punctuation will give you some direction. So we'll, we'll look at some more um, comma usage in just a bit. Um, uh, you use commas to separate the elements in a series um, before conjunctions. But, and here's where an editor uh, comes in handy. There are times when that rule doesn't apply. And you can see the other. I'm not going to read each one, but some of the other uh, usages of commas. I have a, a sheet, and if anybody wants that, I'm happy to, to email it to you. I have a sheet, um, or oh, not a sheet, five pages of directions on proper use of commas. Um, I teach a group of writers every Wednesday. There's a little over 150 writers in the group. and. Uh, one of the most common things that I see is people don't know where to put commas. And it makes a difference in how um, the flow of your, your writing is. Um, anybody want to tell me where they put the commas here? <laughs> Unless you have disabled elderly pregnant children, you probably want to have commas uh, separating some of the, the uh, 
listings here so that everybody can use the, the toilet. Or here's an example. Um, obviously, even magazines get it wrong. Um, I'm assuming they get it wrong. Rachel Ray isn't finding inspiration in cooking her family and cooking her dog. So some commas would have come in handy. Um, sometimes people put in commas when they um, don't need them too. So if here's an example, if uh, clubbing those clubbing baby seals, and uh, I guess they got a little carried away there. Another place that writers tend to have issues is with apostrophes. I'm not going to read through all of this. You can go back and look through it um, when you've got the replay and maybe print out some material, and I'm happy to, to send a list of things for that too. Um, also, a common problem is use of apostrophes, and here's some of the, uh, the standard things that you need to be aware of. Um, I've got some fun examples of those, but um, overall, just t make note of some of these things, like, am I checking where my apostrophes belong when I'm proofreading my work? Um, apostrophes, and, and I see all the time the apostrophes used incorrectly um, when it, it's uh, when a uh, word or actually usually it's uh, just a letter is omitted where the apostrophe belongs and um, it's instead of um, I, some people will do ITS or they'll use the apostrophe when it shouldn't be there. Um, the word there um, they are versus T-H-E-I-R versus, versus T-H-E-R-E. -E. Um, that's a real common one that, that people um, make mistakes on. And often I think they just they type in something and then when they proof that they don't catch it. But that's one to watch out for. Um, <laughs> I think that the teacher wouldn't be real tickled with this student's grasp of use of apostrophes. Um, your should be U apostrophe R E in case you're someone who doesn't catch that kind of thing. And then there's places where you don't use apostrophes at all. And here's some example examples, um, like in the 1800s, 1900s, so on, for CDs, rules of law, numbers of people. And, and then there's some places where the usual rules about apostrophes don't apply at all. Um, so there's some examples, minding your P's and Q's, and if there um, aren't any ifs, ands, or buts about it. And so none of the rules that you look up will apply there. Um, there's frequently some pretty big mistakes made in punctuation in business. Um, obviously here Sundays does not need an apostrophe because it's not possessing anything and it would have to be um, like Sunday's best would have an apostrophe, for example. And Lee, I, I think this is a picture of uh, Wayne's other arm. Um, nothing lasts forever. Obviously, <laughs> the tattoos Basically last forever. Basically describes my love life. <laughs> According to Angie. <laughs> well, Angie, well, Angie, Angie just yelled out, what love life? You don't have to be hurtful. <laughs> well, so, so get a different tattoo. <laughs> really? I would drop um, forever. That could work too. Just take just take out the apostrophe. Really. <laughs> um, quotation marks are a huge challenge for lots of writers, um, and there's some some rules that um, I'll get to in just a minute that um, are confusing. Um, here's an example. You 
please do not use quotation marks for emphasis. And uh, this obviously is a, a picture from a, a, a poster board or a posting uh, mat. And uh, the person who replied also didn't have to use italics. I had to point that out. And then there's um, suspicious quotation marks. When you use quotation marks to emphasize words, th that's really not done. Uh, so when you say wash hands and you put quotation marks around it, that implies that they're doing something other than actually washing hands. And uh, I, I make a lot of mistakes in my own writing, and as I'll tell anyone, I am not my um, best proof. I'm not not even a halfway good proofreader for my own work, so um, no one is. But at least none of my mistakes uh, are up on billboards the way that this one is. So. Um, I want to say that there's obviously a number of things that one needs to be aware of when writing and editing. And for starters, you need to write with balance, especially with action scenes or dialogue when writing fiction. With nonfiction, today's reader gets bored easily, so make sure that you infuse some personality. If you're writing a how-to, Make sure each step is understandable and clear. Um, that's where a proofreader is so critical because what you think is a logical step or process may not be clear to the reader at all. One of the things <clears throat> with um, writers who are, are putting their books up on Amazon, which everybody should be obviously, is to keep in mind the look inside the book feature. And be sure that this part of your manuscript, above all, sparkles. One of the things uh, that I do as a, a book editor with a marketing background is I make sure that that front part of your book really engages so that, that people are buying the book, that it's not what I call a slow introduction. Another thing you want to be careful of is repetition, unless you're summarizing some steps. Um, I find that a lot of writers, uh, nonfiction writers, beat the same topic to death so many times, and you really don't want to be doing that. Also, watch your breaks. And uh, breaks, for example, would be used for point of view with um, uh, fiction, if there's a point of view change, you need to have a new paragraph. So that's one example. Um, also with nonfiction um, and, and with fiction, make sure that there's enough breaks in your, your paragraphing that you don't have what I call a, a block of darkness. If you pick up your, your Kindle or if you have Kindle on your on your computer, and you look at the text, visually see whether or not that text looks like just a, a total sheet of black ink, or if there are some paragraph breaks. The reader's eye is pleased more by those paragraph breaks, and it, it just looks better overall. Uh, watch for speaker attribution. And what I mean by that is don't try to come up with everything in the book besides the word said. Too often new writers use attribution in ways that can be funny or even annoying. And if you don't know what I'm talking about and you don't know how to do that well, there's a great book that I recommend that's called Shut Up, He Explained. <laughs> I'll give you some, some tips on 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 uh, attribution. Some other things to watch for include your dialogue mechanics, your interior monologue, and narrative distance and use of narrative summary. And when I when I talk about um, narrative summary, there's you've you've all heard show don't tell. Sometimes there's a, a little bit of telling is okay. That's what that narrative summary is about. 
because you don't want a book that is all dialogue um, because that wears the readers out. You also want to be aware of your point of view and make sure that your point of view is consistent. Um, something that's kind of fun with fiction is to have really good beats and by beats that's something that um, causes a that pause between your um, one speaker and another or even even the same speaker but it's a little tiny break for the reader maybe it's um, oh giving them um, some idea of the setting for example or um, maybe that you're using some interior dialogue um, but whatever you sometimes want to have those beats so it breaks things up. Um, so oops. back to um, quotation marks. Um, you always want to have quotation marks around your quoted material. That's kind of a no-brainer and around spoken words. But something that a lot of people don't know is that the quotation marks are different depending upon where in the world you live. So the quotation marks always go outside the punctuation in the United States, but not so in other parts of the world. Um, and single quotation marks in the United States are always used to set off a quote within a quote, while the reverse is true elsewhere. So I, I suppose in some ways, if you get your quotation marks wrong, you can just say you're writing for an international audience. But it's important to know um, what the mechanics are, so um, you, can, you can be the best writer that you possibly can. Um, I want everybody to hold their hands up and take a, a pledge with me. <laughs> and uh, what, what I am uh, suggesting here is that a, um, the proofreading that you do is not using your spell checker and your grammar checker on your computer. Um, show you some examples where that would uh, not serve you well. Um, using the wrong words, <laughs> um, respecting R instead of O-U-R, and um, interesting that they're suggesting that they need to speak English and this person obviously doesn't know how, how to write English very well. And um, buying cars, B-U-Y, your spell checker is not going to catch those kind of mistakes. Um, and, and again, I said I'm, I'm glad all my mistakes aren't up on billboards. Um, so they needed a proofreader here because it should be public schools. <laughs> I went to that school. Well, like I said on the slide, it needs more funding. <laughs> uh, it, it, here's, here's one of my favorites, lack, toast, and tolerant. So um, obviously, obviously didn't catch that it should be lactose intolerant, which um, spell checker wouldn't get. And the, uh, the higher me, maybe, maybe that person is a little higher than um, we want to thank <laughs> because it should be H-I-R-E. Um, here's one of my all-time favorites. Um, all others will be toad instead of T-O-W-E-D. I think Wayne Sandiford wrote that side. <laughs> and you can use spell checker to catch the worst spelling mistakes. Um, Spell checker would have caught some things like like uh, caution and uh, horse <laughs> and ra riding instead of raiding, or maybe these people were raiding horses. I'm not sure. <laughs> so 
let's let's get into um, the different types of editing and the range of fees. Uh, the most basic form of editing is proofreading. It also costs the least. Um, fees can be as much as five cents per word. But I would really recommend that you don't pay anyone to proofread. Um, do your own proofreading first, and I'm going to give you some other tips on how you can do that. Have other people proofread for you to get the most basic things. Maybe there's some people within this group who want to exchange proofreading so that the, the basics are done. If you do that, it's going to save you a lot of money when you get a professional editor. The, the next step up is line editing, and this will catch the flaws in logic or flow, some character inconsistencies, and so on. And the, the fees on line editing range from about 8 to 10 cents per word. I'm going to give you some tips to eliminate some unnecessary words later, too. So um, when you do that, every time you eliminate one of those words, you can think, hey, I just saved eight cents. <laughs> and then there's uh, the next level up, uh, the skilled book editors. This is the highest level of editing, and um, editors who are doing this kind of editing will take on issues such as pace and narrative stagnation, uh, stilted dialogue. Um, they, they might insert some things like some of the, the beats that I talked about. Um, so they'll be They'll be really um, holding your hand as a writer and showing you where you can make your writing stronger and where you can tighten it or where you may need to expand a bit. This kind of ed editor, the fees range from 10 to 25 cents per word. And I will share that I'm on the lower end of that scale. Um, I only take on a, a few uh, full-length books to edit each year, and, and um, I'm I'm able to keep my prices low. So what sh you should do before you look for an editor is, I just want to repeat that basic stage of proofreading yourself. So here's the, the top five ways that you can proofread your work. Obviously, you want to spell check, and that's just to catch misspelled words. Um, you won't catch words that are uh, the wrong words. Read your work out loud. I find that if I have the, the writers that I work with in this group that I talked about that I run on Wednesdays, if, if I see something that's not correct, I'll often have them read it out loud, and they catch everything that, that should be caught if they take that step. Now, another thing that you can do is read your work backwards. I don't mean starting at the end of a sentence and, and working it that way, but start at the end of a chapter and read your last paragraph. See if it reads cleanly. And then move up until you reach the, the beginning of your, your uh, chapter. What happens when we proofread our own work is we know what we meant, and so if we're reading it just as we have it on the page um, from, the, from the start, then we, we tend to miss a lot of things. So this little trick of um, reading your work from the end of it on back up to the beginning is a really good way to catch a lot of other, other mistakes. Um, this is maybe the most important thing that you can do, and it is where I catch a lot of my own mistakes. I mean, I, there's even a couple of mistakes that I, I caught in the, the slides that are things that I would have changed, that had I let the work set for a longer period of time, I would have caught. Um, you, you definitely, definitely want to allow some time for your work to um, have a breather, uh, at least a couple of weeks, and ideally about a month. 
And then this uh, final step I already talked about, do some exchanges to proofread. So there's some things that you should look for in a, in a book editor. The most obvious thing is they need to have experience editing books. <laughs> Um, lots and lots of times I'll have people tell me, oh, I had my English uh, teacher or, you know, somebody with some kind of a degree or somebody who was a magazine editor, um, for example, or a newspaper editor, look at, at my, my writing, and those are not book editors. Uh, for starters, the style um, that magazine and, and um, newspaper editors use is different than for books. Plus there's so many other factors that come into play when you're, when you're writing a book that a good book editor is acquainted with. Now there's some not so obvious things that you need to look for. Um, you want somebody that's easy to work with. You don't want them to change your writing for voice. Um, you want them to look at your work and give you a bid. Anybody that says, well, I've got a flat fee of X amount, they're really not being fair to the writer because some writers have work that's a lot cleaner and it doesn't take as much work. So if, if you're looking at um, employing somebody with a flat fee, you might want to have them examine that. You also want to find somebody who's willing to do a sample edit of one or two pages and that doesn't necessarily mean for free. Um, you, you want an editor who's willing to ask questions to make sure they're clear on what you meant and provide um, examples, or I mean a, explanations rather, um, about any changes they're suggesting and, and make sure that their communication with you is really good. Um, at this, at the higher levels, you'll you'll get some editors who also check for factual accuracy. You want somebody who is aware of consistency of tone and presentation, clarity, um, and very important, uh, making sure that you're using the active voice. You should ask as I, I said, to have a few pages edited first so you can see if the editor is really a good fit for you. Um, until you see what they catch, you probably think your work is already perfect. The, the problem is, if, if you think it's perfect, you don't know what, what could be caught. So you really need to um, see the kinds of things that, that an editor will catch. Um, one point that a lot of writers aren't aware of that I want to mention here is that the Chicago Manual of Style is a style guide that's used for books. Um, as I mentioned with um, newspaper and uh, magazines, they use a whole different style guide. And especially if, you're, if you've written for newspapers or magazines in the past, um, you may need a, a refresher using this Chicago Manual of Style. Um, <clears throat> here's some other tips. Um, I mentioned um, active voice. You want to use that as much as is appropriate. Um, I had been thinking of would become something more like thoughts nudge themselves to the front themselves to the front of my brain. So you can see that thoughts nudging themselves is a lot more active than I had been thinking. So take a look at how um, much you use active voice in your, in your fiction. Um, here's one, and I talked about saving yourself uh, um, some, some money on your editing, and one of the things that I always look at when I, I edit is replacing the words was and it with better choices whenever possible. Um, was is one of those kind of dead words, doesn't have any movement, and it is almost always better replaced with um, a description. 
Also read your sentences without the word that and see if they make sense. And um, that's where you can save eight cents if you eliminate all the extra that's that shouldn't be there. Um, you also want to learn how to use narration effectively so your manuscripts do more showing than telling. Um, and these are, these are some, just a few of dozens and dozens of tips and I, I hope to have more information up on my website soon with some of these so you can, you can use uh, a chip sheet to go through and, and self-edit. Um, but here's another one. Be sure you know the difference between the use of which and that. That's a real common mistake that people made uh, make in their writing. And writing out your numbers, that's something a lot of writers don't know. But if, if you're writing books, you are um, supposed to write out any number that's under 100. Um, although the word all right spelled A-L-R-I-D, GHT is um, considered slang. It is being used a lot, and I suspect that in a few years they'll they'll make that um, part of the the uh, proper dictionary usage. But for now, two words "all right" is proper. Um, so how do you know when it's time to launch a book? There are a lot of factors to weigh, and I'm going to go into some explanation of why some of these factors matter. So first of all, um, whether you have an ebook or a printed book, uh, sometimes an ebook can be used as a bit of a test before launching a printed book. If you do that, you'll see if there's room for improvement and how people respond. You want to, at minimum, however, have the basic proofreading done. If you get any negative comments, um, those can't be rescinded. Um, the weight of them can be um, reduced, and, and Leland's good at showing people how they can um, have some good reviews and, and make the top reviews pop up. Um, but but if you are getting some, especially if someone is saying this book is poorly written, it's time for you to, to take a look at your writing style and the things you can do to, to improve. You might want to use the strategy of having an ebook out for a month or two before you go into print. Um, if you do that, you'll catch other things and maybe discover even that there's more that you want to say. I've had ebooks out where I thought, oh gosh, I, I didn't include, you know, whatever, and I want to include that, so I would just um, add to that ebook and then um, put it back up on, on um, Amazon and some of the other ebook formats. And of course, with an ebook, you can make changes as often as you desire. Not so with a printed book. With a printed book, you absolutely want to go the professional book editor route right at the start. Even if you're doing print on demand and think you'll just upload a new file, if you make very many changes, you have to purchase a new um, ISBN number, the international standard book number. So um, print on demand still has the restrictions on how many times you can you can add new copy or make corrections. Another factor is timing. If you have a book that's addressing a hot topic and the window of opportunity might close soon, you might get away with just proofreading and line editing. So that would be an exception that um, I certainly would consider for a book that has a, a very um, limited window of time where that book's going to be current. With material of any length, there's a much greater chance of there being errors in flow and character continuity, point of view, and other issues. Here's where I'd say you absolutely can't skip the professional book editing. The 
purpose of your material is an important consideration too. If your audience includes people who are well educated, obviously you need to have your work edi edited. And you know, again, do you want to be taken seriously? Even with how-to books that are structured simply to convey information, if you're sloppy, people may not consider you knowledgeable. If you want to be considered for something like a book award, editing is essential. Something else to consider is the type of material. There are some kinds of material that don't need a professional editor, just someone who knows how to check for basic spelling and grammar corrections. Some of the instances I can think of would be for a recipe book or maybe some of the books for children. Um, the, the books for children, that should be uh, basically a picture book with some lines of text underneath, one or two sentences. Probably don't need a professional editor for that, a professional book editor. Um, this is a no-brainer, but you don't want to launch until your editing is completed. I see lots of writers who are so darn thrilled that they finally got the book finished that they just want to jump in and get it online. And that's a big mistake. At least go back to the five ways I mentioned to proofread your own work and follow those steps, especially letting the work set for a little bit. I'm often asked how much time does an editor need. First of all, a professional book editor may have other books that he or she is editing, so you may have to get in line. And that's why it's a good idea to plan ahead and get a commitment from the editor for a certain time to start editing your work, if you possibly can. I've had writers who say, I know I'll be finished by August 1st, for example, and would you block out time to edit for me then? And that's a really good approach. A good editor is going to read your work four or five times, plus they will be engaging with you throughout the process if there's rewriting to be done. So uh, a month to six weeks is the average amount of time that a, a book editor is going to need. And naturally, shorter or longer books are going to affect the time. One of the things that I also want to share with you is that what you find online isn't always the best source. Often people who list themselves as editors just know, know how to make themselves more visible, which, you know, that's an art in itself, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're good at editing. Just this week I saw a young woman and she ranks quite high on Google for book editing. And when I read her description, it was full of spelling and grammar mistakes. So just because they are visible, like I said, doesn't mean they make a good editor. Um, that's one reason it's imperative to have a few pages edited to see what kind of things the editor will catch or what they won't catch if you want to sprinkle in a few gotchas. <laughs> but do that before you ask them to edit an entire book. So there's some places where you can look for editors. But do keep in mind that all anyone has to do to be a member of these associations that I'm going to list is pay a fee. Um, so you still want to vet these editors and go through that process that I talked about. And Lee, I'll, I'll uh, post these on the forum so everybody will have those. Perfect. There's the, the National Association of Independent Writers and Editors. That's one. There's the Editorial Freelance Association and the Editors Association of Canada. Now, I didn't look to see if there were editors in other um, countries besides Canada, and I'm, I'm sure there are, but obviously with the internet you can, you can pick an editor from anywhere. I'm uh, currently working on a project for a gal from the Netherlands. Um, there's also a site that I think everyone might want to check out called Editors and Predators. Um, I'll list that one too, Lee. Cool. And on the um, Editors and Predators site, you'll see some places that put up their shingle as editors that uh, don't have, let's say, 
the best reputation. So here's my best tip of the day. Have five to ten pages of your work edited by a really good book editor. You'll see that there's some consistent types of mistakes that you make. And absolutely everyone has them. I'm, I have my own tip sheet that I use when, when I'm writing. You'll see um, that what those are, um, once you get that back, knowing what those mistakes are will give you a foundation for improving your work overall. Then write those things on a recipe card and watch for them when you're writing and editing for yourself. Just take that up on your computer screen screen and I promise it will be a help. So I'm one of those editors who can show you how to improve your writing and for anyone who's associated with Lee, I'm going to offer to do a synopsis of how you can improve your style um, for just $25. I'll look at the first five pages and then give you a full breakdown of what you can do on your own to make improvements. And ordinarily, that'd be something that I'd charge $175 for, but I wanted to do this as a, a thank you to, to Lee and the group. So um, I know, too, that a lot of people on the group are on tight, um, really tight, some of you, budgets. So I have a freebie on my website, and uh, Leland's going to list that website. Um, yeah, it's in, the, uh, it's in the chat box, people. Um, and that freebie um, that you'll find on the site talks about crowdfunding. So when I hear people talk about not being able to afford an editor or you know some of the, the various other costs associated with the book, I always try and point them to crowdfunding as a way to get that done. Um, crowdfunding is a way to get money from strangers. Um, <laughs> If you need money um, like for, like I said, editing or any part of the production of your book, that's um, a source for you to consider. There are some highly creative people who do crowdfunding, including some who have raised over half a million to get their books in print. Obviously, it didn't take quite that much, so they have a, a little bit extra in their pocket. Um, and half a million is, of course, unusual, but it's not unusual to raise two or three thousand. So if you're looking to get your book into print um, and need, like I said, an ISBN number or maybe you want to go with a little higher level of um, cover art production, maybe you need to pay for a good editor, um, those are some um, things that you could, could get the funding for. Um, so that, that's one of the freebies on my website. Um, there's several, but I think that's probably the one that's most valuable for this group. So with that, I just want to thank everybody for attending and especially thank Lee for the opportunity to, opportunity to share some of my tips and techniques. All right, thanks. Let me change over, Linda. Give me a moment, people, and uh, we'll do this. Let's see, did I do that right? I think I got it. Let me check. Yeah, okay. Uh, Linda, I appreciate your time. I know you, it's very valuable. You got, uh, you're got you a publisher and author, and you got so much stuff going on, and it kind of makes you, you're the Leland Benton in a skirt. Uh, one of the things people, I want, to, I want to point out a couple things that Linda brought out that I find in with not only our authors, but with our forum authors. Ever since we introduced the We Do It All program, and we're posting audiobooks for the forum authors, uh, all types, we do in CreateSpace, Lulu.com, Smashwords. There is a very big difference in putting up a digital book on Amazon or Smashwords versus putting up a printed book, or a POD, print-on-demand book, on Lulu.com and CreateSpace. If you are going to put up a POD book on CreateSpace and Lulu, you definitely need a Linda Sterling. All right. If you're doing an audio book, 
All right, the way you do an audio book if you're using ACX is you post a script, which is usually the first two chapters in a text file, which strips away all the illustrations, and you let the narrators come in audition, and you pick from those auditions a narrator you want. If your script is fraught with errors, your the narrators are not going to bid on it. And we had that problem. Some of the books that we were putting up on audiobooks, we had to spot edit and clean them up before we could even put them up because the narrators would run like mad from it. They are not allowed to change your words. So they would be speaking the, the incorrect punctuation, everything that Linda brought up. So be careful. If you're going to do print-on-demand and you're going to do audiobooks, you definitely need to edit it first. That's not saying you don't do it for Amazon or digital books. But that brings up another subject. All right, remember your royalties on Amazon is 70% or 35%. All right, it takes a lot of books to be sold in order to pay for editing, to pay for book covers, to pay for uh, ghostwriting, et cetera, et cetera. You have to take that into consideration. Smashwords pays you 85%. So they have a better, uh, they have a better royalty, but they don't have the audience or the buyers in their own reading device like Amazon has. So my point is, when you're when you're putting together your book, you got to take a look at costs. Not only your time, but are you going to be able to recover your costs for your marketing, your promotion, and for your design, etc. So bear that in mind. Uh, I, as I said, I put into the chat box her uh, website, her new website, and her email address. And again, you can contact Linda by PM and her on the forum. If you have any questions, put in, put your questions in the box now while Linda's still on. Uh, we're just coming up on the hour, which is our time is good. But I want to make sure you understand that editing is very, very important. And, and I violate it too, even though my stuff is edited. It drives me nuts when people like Julia Bush, who's on the, the webinar right now, PMs me and shows me the mistakes, and I feel like drop kicking my office staff out into the parking lot because no matter what we do to make our stuff as perfect as possible, it still falls through the cracks. And one thing is that we've been doing is, and I, and I appreciate Linda saying to let it set before you come back to it, but while it's setting, give it to another proofreader to go over it and switch back and forth and get a second opinion, so to speak, and a second edit job if you can afford it. Uh, that's definitely worth it. We've been catching a lot doing that. But even still, it's something that you're always, uh, it's always a work in progress to to make your stuff as perfect as possible. And your readers really do appreciate it. Linda's really right on that one. They really are very good at catching mistakes in your books and posting it in reviews. It's kind of like they look forward to it. Uh, that's just something that we suffer as authors and something that we can do a better job of and using people like Linda. There is, uh, uh, Linda, thank you for those resources. Definitely I want a copy of your five-page uh, uh, style uh, list that you mentioned, and I'll make it available in the download portal of the webinar so that people can, uh, when they're accessing the replay, and I'll have the replay up on uh, YouTube uh, so the Mac users can uh, get it. Uh, one thing that we get a lot of emails on, and I want to speak to it before we sign off, uh, everything on the Kindle platform is changeable except the DRM box that you must check yes or no when you publish. Everything else is changeable. And that doesn't mean you lose your reviews. If you redo the book and you upload the book and it's completely redone, you're not penalized. All right, now, Here's another thing. You've all noticed that I made a form post on it that Amazon now has a spell check at the uh, between the cover or uh, right after you publish the book. It will give you a spell check notice that they, they found uh, misspelled words. Generally, I notice when I open it up on my books, it's for uh, people's personal names. All right. What that's telling you is that very soon now, Amazon is going to start penalizing for books that are not edited. And my 
sources in Amazon tell me that it's coming very quickly. They are really going to clean up their platform and the books that are being sold. They're going to get rid of a lot of books that are just thrown up there just to see if they'll make some money. So bear that in mind. I see it coming down the road in the next couple months where they're going to start spot editing uh, using a program that they're developing. And they're not going to publish a book until you correct the errors in the book, just like they do the spell checker, even though you can click ignore and it'll go green and you can publish the book. So bear that in mind. Listen to what Linda's teaching you. All right. Start uh, getting your books edited. At least start the process. Uh, take Linda up on her $25 offer. That's very good. Thank you, Linda. And uh, get a taste for this. I know uh, when I write, I try to keep my ego out of it. And, and unfortunately, a lot of authors have their egos in their books, and there's no place for ego. All right. Readers do not pay for your ego. They pay for your words, and they pay for the knowledge and the education that they can read in your book or the entertainment value. Okay, I don't see any questions. So, Linda, thank you again. Uh, if you do have any questions that come up after we come off the webinar, feel free to contact Linda, and we'll see you on the next one, which probably will be at the end of June. Uh, sometime in July, depending on how I recover from my operation on Monday. But I'll keep you posted. I know Angie will keep you posted, too. So God bless. Stay well, and we'll talk soon.